most of these quotes that I'm going to be showing you is actually in reference to abiogenesis. When uh, abiogenesis is, is the idea that matter can organise itself, that um, life can be formed from nothing. All the evidence, current scientific evidence that we have is that life can only come from existing parents some form of parent. We don't have any evidence in science that life can come from nothing, so I'm going to show you these quotes of scientists throughout the throughout the last hundred years or so who have had their problems with evolution and their opinion. The kind of full debunk on abiogenesis, most of these quotes. Okay? And in Darwin's time, the belief that microbes could emanate easily from non-living materials was very common. But five years after the publication of The Origin of Species, the famous French biologist Louis Pasteur scientifically refuted these myths that lay ground for evolution. Pasteur, after lengthy studies and experiments, reached this very important conclusion can matter organize itself? No. Today there is no circumstance known under which one could affirm that microscopic beings have come into the world without parents resembling themselves. The first evolutionist to take up the issue of the origin of life in the 20th century was the Russian biologist Alexander Oparin. His aim was to explain how the first living cell, the alleged common ancestor of all living beings according to the theory of evolution, could emerge. In the 1930s, Oparin formulated a number of theories to show how the first living cell could arise from inanimate matter by chance. However, his efforts ended in failure and Oparin himself had to confess. Unfortunately, the origin of the cell remains a question that is actually the murkiest aspect of the whole theory of evolution. Every evolutionist attempt in the 20th century to account for the origin of life has ended in failure. Jeffrey Beta a professor of geochemistry and a leading advocate of the theory of evolution, confesses this fact in the February 1998 issue of Earth, one of the leading periodicals of evolutionist literature. Today, as we leave the 20th century, we still face the biggest unsolved problem that we had when we entered the 20th century. How did life originate on Earth? Today, not even the most sophisticated laboratory has been able to produce a single living cell from non-living matter. Indeed, this is fully acknowledged to be impossible and efforts to produce living cells from non-living matter have been abandoned. But the theory of evolution claims that this system which man with all his intelligence, knowledge and technology cannot succeed in reproducing, came into existence by chance. Sir Fred Hoyle, a prominent English mathematician and astronomer, explains the impossibility of this with an example. The chance that higher life forms might have emerged by chance is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. All the other efforts by evolutionists in the 20th century could do nothing but only confirm that natural selection had no evolutionary power. A famous evolutionist, the English paleontologist Colin Patterson, admitted this when he said, no one has ever produced a species by mechanisms of natural selection. No one has ever got near it. And most of the current argument in neo-Darwinism is about this question.
Darwin called these hypothetical creatures transitional forms. He knew that in order to support his theory, the remains of such intermediate forms had to be found in the fossil record. And the origin of species, he wrote, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties linking most closely all the species of the same group together must assuredly have existed. Consequently, evidence of their former existence could be found only amongst fossil remains. However, Darwin was aware that the fossil record did not contain any of these hypothetical intermediate forms. This is why he devoted a special chapter to this in his book and pose these troubled questions. Why, if species have descended from other species by fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitional forms? But as by this theory, innumerable transitional forms must have existed, why do we not find them embedded in countless numbers in the crust of the Earth? Darwin had supposed that such transitional forms would be discovered when the fossil record was inspected more carefully. Subsequently, evolutionists that followed him examined geological layers all around the world for 140 years and looked for these missing fossils. All these efforts ended with great despair. The transitional forms imagined by Darwin remained just that, figments of imagination. English paleontologist Derek Ager admits this fact, though he is an evolutionist. The point emerges that if we examine the fossil record in detail, whether at the level of orders or of species, we find over and over again, not gradual evolution, but the sudden explosion of one group at the expense of another. In strata older than the Cambrian, no fossils of any creatures except a few unicellular organisms are to be seen. In the Cambrian period, however, many diverse species appear quite abruptly. More than 30 invertebrate species, such as jellyfish, starfish, trilobites, and snails emerge all of a sudden. These living beings have complex body systems, such as the circulatory system, and also very complex organs. For instance, the eye of the trilobite is made of hundreds of honeycomb-like cells, each having a double lens system. It is a wonder of design. This is the first eye that appeared on the Earth, and it definitely refutes the Darwinist claim that life evolved from the very primitive towards the complex. According to the theory of evolution, species must have evolved from pre-existing forms. However, there is no other complex life form known to have existed before the trilobites and other species of the Cambrian period. The Cambrian species came into existence all of a sudden, without any ancestors. A well-known advocate of the theory of evolution, the English zoologist Richard Dawkins makes the following confession on the subject. It is as though the species of the Cambrian were just planted there without any evolutionary history. This situation refutes the theory of evolution for sure, because Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species, if numerous species belonging to the same genera or families have really started into life all at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of descent with slow modification through natural selection. This fatal stroke that frightened Darwin comes from the Cambrian period, right at the outset of the fossil record. In all fossil layers after the Cambrian, living species always appear abruptly and fully formed. The main taxa, such as fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, 
and the hundreds of thousands of different species within them all appeared suddenly in distinct structures. There is not even a single transitional form between any groups as evolutionists imagine. Moreover, there is no difference between fossils hundreds of millions of years old and their modern descendants. For instance, a 400 million year old shark and a modern shark have exactly the same structure. Similarly, there is no difference between a 100 million year old ant and a modern ant, a 135 million year old dragonfly and a modern dragonfly, a 100 million year old turtle and a modern turtle, or a 55 million year old bat and a modern bat. That is, all living kinds were created by God and did not undergo any evolution after their creation. The most important role of this scenario is given to the extinct ape species called Australopithecus. The first Australopithecus fossil was found in 1924 by a paleontologist named Raymond Dart. Since then, evolutionists argue that this ape species, the name of which means southern ape, is a man-like creature. However, when Australopithecus and chimpanzee skeletons are compared, it is seen that there is no important difference between the two. In the face of this fact, evolutionists hypothesized that Australopithecus walked upright on its two feet differently from other apes. However, two world-renowned anatomists, Lord Solly Zuckerman and Professor Charles Oxnard, refuted this allegation. Simply put, Australopithecus, advanced as the ancestor of man by evolutionists, is merely an extinct ape species. On the other hand, fossils that are included by evolutionists under imaginary classifications, such as Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, or Homo sapien archaic, in fact, belong to different human races. When these fossils are inspected, it is seen that their skeletons are essentially the same as those of people living today. The only dissimilarities are a few structural differences in their skulls. But differences like these are to be found in different human races alive on Earth today. The famous evolutionist paleontologist Richard Leakey admits that the difference between the skulls classified as Homo erectus and those of modern men is only racial. These differences are probably no more pronounced than we see today between the separate geographical races of modern humans. The only evidence at hand is generally nothing more than a few skull fragments or a tibia. The hair, skin, nose, ears, lips, or other facial features of a living being cannot be determined from its bone remains. Evolution has shaped these soft tissues, which leave no trace in the fossil, to suit the purposes of their theory and produce imaginary reconstructions in their workshops. Ernest Houghton from Harvard University states that these drawings have no scientific value. You can, with equal facility, 
model on a Neanderthaloid skull the features of a chimpanzee or the lineaments of a philosopher. These alleged restorations of ancient types of man have very little of any scientific value and are likely only to mislead the public. Evolutionists go so far in this subject that they can even invent very different faces for the same skull. The three entirely different reconstructions made for the fossil calls in Xanthropus is a famous example showing how persistent evolutionists are in producing these false masks. Evolutionists engage not only in drawing and modeling tricks, sometimes they commit deliberate forgeries. The most famous of these frauds is the Piltdown fossil introduced in England in 1912 by an evolutionist named Charles Dawson. This fossil was presented as the most important transitional form between ape and man and was displayed in museums for more than 30 years. Experts who re-examined the fossil in 1949 discovered that it was a forgery that had been produced by attaching an orangutan's jaw to a human skull. Another intermediate transitional form fabricated by evolutionists was the Nebraska Man. This was cooked up in 1922 on the basis of a single fossil tooth. The evolutionists did not neglect to give it an ostentatious Latin name, Asparapithecus Harold Cooka, or to make imaginary drawings related to it. It was soon revealed that the tooth that had been the source of inspiration for Nebraska Man in fact belonged to a wild pig. Modern biochemistry has also revealed the unimaginably complex design of the DNA molecule. The structure of the DNA molecule was discovered by two scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick in 1955. Their discovery demonstrated that life was much more complex than anyone had previously envisioned. Himself a confirmed evolutionist, Francis Crick, who received a Nobel Prize for this discovery, came to confess that a structure like DNA could never have emerged by chance. DNA is a giant molecule that exists in the nucleus of the cell. Every detail of a living being's physical and physiological makeup is coated in this double helix. All the information about our bodies from the color of our eyes to the structure of our internal organs and the shape and function of our cells are programmed in sections called genes in the DNA. The DNA code is made up of the sequence of four different bases. If we think of each one of these bases as a letter, DNA can be likened to a data bank made up of an alphabet of four letters. All the information about a living thing is stored in this data bank. If we attempt to write down the information in the DNA, this would take up approximately a million pages. This is equal to an encyclopedia 40 times bigger than the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is one of mankind's greatest single accumulations of information. But this incredible information is stored in the tiny nucleus of our cells, measuring about a thousandth of a millimeter in size. It is calculated that a DNA chain small enough to fill a teaspoon has the capacity to store all the information contained in all the books ever written. Of course, such an amazing structure could never have been formed by chance. The theory of evolution, which sees life as the result of mere coincidences and haphazard happenings, is helpless to explain anything 
in the face of the incredible complexity of DNA. Right, that's you caught up with most of the basic knowledge that I know about that refutes the evolution theory. Um, now I'm going to be taking you on to, as I promised, because this is evolutionists say the damnedest things, I'm going to be taking you on to some of the online arguments I've had, things that people have said to me and we're going to have a wee bit of a laugh about it and I'll show you some of the contradictory things that they say at different times, different people at different times, some of the contradictory things that they say, even the same person at different times and I'll be showing you how ill-informed some of the, the current proponents of the evolution theory are and we're going to be having a, a bit of a laugh about it. That's what's coming up next. I feel as if I did say though that I would take you on and show you other people other than myself, scientists, biologists etc who don't accept the evolution theory and they are either pro-creationist or pro-intelligent design also. And I'll take you and I'll, I'll quickly show you some of that. Right, this guy was Mark Armitage. He's a archaeologist. He managed the biology department's electron and <laughs> confocal <laughs> microscopy suite for California State University. He made a archaeological discovery of the largest triceratops horns ever found and he also found preserved layers of soft tissue. Now I haven't looked into any of this, I'm just telling you Mark Armitage's story. So apparently creationists feel that if they can find soft tissue that's evidence that they um, dinosaur fossils are actually hundreds of thousands of years old rather than millions of years old. Um, I guess in, in terms that the, the tissue hasn't fully broken down. He said that the sheets were brown stretchy sheets and he was shocked to see anything that was pliable. So in February 2013 he published his findings in a journal of cell and tissue research and then two weeks later he was fired and the suit alleges that members hostile to him had him fired because they could not stand working with a creationist who had been published in a legitimate scientific journal so he has made a legitimate scientific discovery he thinks it relates to creationism at the end of the day it doesn't really matter if it relates to creationism or not but he was published in a peer-reviewed journal. His discovery was published in a peer-reviewed journal, so he's obviously very successful at his job. In other circumstances, if you had made a big discovery, your workplace would be pleased because that's good advertising for them, that's good advertising for the California State University because surely students will be attracted to the university to go and study biology at the university where the man who discovered the largest triceratop horns ever is, is a teacher but he wasn't, he was sacked so okay that's a man that was sacked for he feels for being because he, he believed in intelligent design right now I'll take you on to a NASA scientist he, David Cop Coppage um, he claims he was discriminated against because of his belief that a higher power must have had a hand in creation because life is too complex. And he was promoting his views. He was promoting his views at work, so... Um, maybe that was annoying people. Fair enough if they were annoyed, but I don't think it's a, a scenario that he should be getting sacked for. He again was very successful at his job. He worked as a team lead on the Cassini mission exploring Saturn and its many moons and he was sacked because he engaged his co-workers in conversations about intelligent design and he handed out DVDs on the idea while he was at work. So he was very successful at his job. He was involved in very successful missions. He, he was a team lead. He was There's no reason to sack him based on what he was doing at his job but he feels that he was sacked because he was a verbal proponent of the creation intelligent design theory. 
so they're seeing evidence that people can be sent to academic Siberia if they don't agree with the current scientific models. Now this is a guy, Dennis Noble, um, he has done talks on debunking neo-Darwinism, um, he's just completely goes at it from a biologist's point of view, he's I don't think he's particularly interested in either creationism or intelligent design, but as a biologist, his personal opinion is that neo-Darwinism is wrong, and biology itself refutes it. So you can look into Dennis Noble if you like. And then one last guy, Dean Kenyon, he is the professor of biology at San Francisco University and he originally was an evolutionist. He wrote a book on evolution that was published, I think he was considered at the time to be one of the, the foremost leading experts on evolution, but he was questioned in class, this is his story, Dean Kenyon, he was questioned in class by a, a young uh, creationist person and he could not refute what the young creationist person said and so he went away and he he had a think about things. He's actually now a creationist himself and he's still the professor of biology at San Francisco. Um, now I'm going to let him have the final say on this because I feel like the information I've shown you has, has completely debunked what you understand as evolution and I'm now going to take you to his explanation. Someone asks him a question about why he thinks other scientists don't support creation and I'm going to let him, as a, as a foremost expert, he can answer the question before we go on and have a laugh at some evolutionists and the things that they say online. Okay, thank you. Bye. Do many of your colleagues support your new position? Well, most of my colleagues, um, I would have to say the majority of them are are not in support of, uh, of my views on origins, my new views on, on origin first life and, and uh, on evolution. Um, there are some of those who uh, are uh, also not in support of my uh, being able to uh, discuss these matters in, uh, in class. Um, there are a few who are sympathetic um, to uh, an open and free uh, discussion of these matters, although not all of those are sympathetic to the to my views themselves. A couple are. Uh, I'm not not the only one who, uh, uh, in the uh, science faculty here, who would uh, have views uh, like I do about origins. As to why there is this um, attitude on the part of the faculty, uh, uh, I'm not sure that I could give a a quick answer. I mean, you have to ask them, of course. But uh, I think deeply ingrained habits of thought is a, is is a factor. Uh, when one has been uh, trained uh, to to uh, accept uh, and to really be only aware of uh, one particular explanation of origins, the Darwinian account and the standard ev chemical evolutionary material, uh, and not ever having read a single critical paper, or certainly not having read a single article defending intelligent design, uh, perhaps it's not surprising that uh, there would be this kind of uh, reluctance to to support this. I suspect that some of them may themselves suspect that a rather major uh, reorientation of thinking would follow if uh, they were to give serious consideration to to this to the literature on this subject and have said, "Well, I just don't want to do that. Um, it, it, it's going to involve uh, something that I'm not prepared to do in the way of major uh, reassessment of uh, some parts of biology, although much of I believe much of biology will will remain intact.